Okay, we'll figure it out. But it's got you can't just walk up and do it. You gotta also just pop up. So you're gonna have to like go on your hands and knees and crawl. Right? I I'll, I'll do it. And it can't be like I me, mean, it's gotta be at a special time. There it is. I want that person in Kuwait watching this to be terrifying. Huh? Did you ever watch the Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, All right. Those people are idiots. Before we get started, let me show you Nikola Te Nikolai Tesla in his laboratory. That's all I got. All right, let's get to work. Does everyone have the DBQ? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're gone. Dude, why do I keep pressing the phone? Anybody else need to be here? What did you just say? All right. By the way, now we have a new we have a parachute. Yeah, I don't know, it's pretty cool. It's already the shark. It's a fry, It's a fry, No, it's a fry. Okay, so everyone, we have this out. Are any questions on this? Remember, brainstorm outline thesis. You need. A brainstorm list, use those facts for your, your facts for your essay. Remember to rate it, re, relate a document to each fact. You have to do that in your outline. It is due on what day? Wednesday. On Tuesday, you can ask questions. Would you like a little bit of reading on top of that? No. Let me ask again. Would you like a little bit of reading on top of that? No. Yay! 956 to 983. Wednesday also. Okay, do today. Finish chapter 20 now. Finish chapter 20. Do Monday. Yep, I'm going to be here working. Working for you. They don't let me go home. I don't get breaks. I was shaking my head. You have too many loyalties going on there. Okay, so. Do we get to this? I told you. Oh yes, I told you about the satellite orbiting the Earth. Got it. So, did we get the United Fruit? Who killed McKinley? A wild boar. Leon Zaldash. Zaldash assassinated. Did he get his name? Well, I just don't understand why I wrote Leon Frank. Leon Frank Zaldash. Zaldash. He was a what? What was his philosophy? He thought, you know, trigger revolution. What was he? Bomb throwing anarchists. And who did? Big stick, who's that? And what was the corollary? The what? <laughs> to and the Monroe Dog. So the US can intervene where? Yeah. Western hemisphere is hemisphere of car. What country do we first do it in? <laughs> well Philippines we invaded before that, and that's not the Western Hemisphere. We say Cuba both what's what happened right after the corollary? Venezuela. Venezuela was right before. Maybe someone said it. The Dominican Republic, I didn't hear that. It came in and stole the money from it. So let's get right to it. So we got right to here. Yes. United Fruit was the biggest of all the... Huh? Let's just get to democracy. Do we get to democracy? Yeah, they did not want democracy. Dictatorships. Dictatorships would open up the markets. The best way to control that is for the United States. We're dictators because the people might want crazy things like the money staying in their country. Remember, the Dominican Republic had 55% of the tax revenues going to creditors. And so, therefore, a lot of us get the debt back, the money back. Banks would make risky loans, and the U.S. would come in and get their money back. And United Fruit.
this was one of the biggest corporations in the world still is a huge corporation a big holding company they they would take up eventually 90 percent of the arable land in latin america they'd either own or control in central america i'm sorry central america so basically between mexico and colombia and yes they grow a lot of products but the biggie i think you can see bananas and they would try to romanticize it with the banana boat and, and um like they had to fill up there to take a trip down to the banana country but these this became the dominant country or company the dominant force in many latin american countries they would market their bananas under the name chiquita so if you see chiquita bananas today in fact there are two basic types of bananas you can buy because it's an oligopoly a dole or a chiquita in fact by the 1960s they would get so powerful you can see on this picture right there they had a banana-shaped satellite that still to this day orbits the Earth, beaming banana-related propaganda into our minds 24 hours a day. Does it work? Who had a banana today? Yeah. And all of you want a banana now, don't you? You can't help it. I have had, this is my second banana. I'm going to have it after school. So it works. What's the only way to stop it? Tinfoil tin hats. We got it's a tinfoil hat. All of you from now on, we're tinfoil. It works. But they ran the company. Have you ever heard the term banana republic before? Okay, banana republic it comes from these, and a lot of people would believe it must be the republic where bananas are from. There's a store called that too. But the, the company or the country where bananas are grown. No. Banana republics meant the banana company ran the country. In fact, the name they would give it, and this should sound familiar, in Latin America, they would call United Fruit the octopus. Remember those pictures I showed you of, of Standard Oil? There's always like an octopus with all its tentacles. That's you know, a very popular picture of something that controls the government, the society. Lastly, you know, the generically oil, oil, timber, I could also put mining. All sorts of companies would come in. In the 1990s, it would start being like textile manufacturers will come in, do the same thing. So this is not ended. And that's basic diplomacy. And so Dominican Republic Republic's a good example. Cuba, they're all good. But one we have, oh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua, the United States would occupy for almost all the first 30 years of the 20th century. And they would come in. Uh, it was the norm that said in the Marines, are, those are Marines in Managua. And the biggest justification was always was the huge public debt owned by the government of Nicaragua. And they would come in and take over the economy to make sure the banks in the United States get their money back. They also for United Fruit, too. And there's a reason why Nicaragua is in such trouble now, because the wealth was all sucked out. Those Marines there, sometimes we forget you just think the Marines have this amorphous group. No, those are human beings, very intelligent, and that's in this case men, and they knew exactly what they were doing. They were posing with this flag, not because they found the flag. No, this is the flag they brought because they knew exactly what they were doing. What are they calling themselves? Yeah, we're just down here to loot and pillage. They knew it. They're not dumb. They could see it. They're just stealing from the poor people of Nicaragua. Well, actually, they're not getting anything from it, but it's going up to other places. And by the way, these are Jeff Forbes. Riding pants. And you see a lot of them, so they must have, been, must have been in the cavalry. I see those and I associate them with the German army. Nobody else does, but I do. Okay, so the Panama Canal, though, might be the classic example of basic diplomacy. This put everything together, and the elements of its still remain today. Okay, there had been a desire to build a canal. Nicaragua was first. It was flatter. It had some lakes, but it turned out to be too long. Panama, narrow, but was very mountainous, very rugged. And the other thing was this. Panama was owned by Colombia. Panama was a province of Colombia. I should add, the Spanish-American War convinced everybody in the U.S. At least pushed the idea of the U.S. government, we need a canal. 
Because when the U.S. Navy split between both oceans, it had to get here because of Cuba. Look how much further it is to go around the Cape of Good Hope. And so with that, the United States began to negotiate with, with Colombia. And so, jumping ahead, here's a good cartoon. You know, it's in Rough Rider garb, and there is little Colombia. Because what happened was this. First off, I should say, got to bring this guy up, Philippe Borna Morella. He was working for a French company. Yeah, it's called the Panama Canal Company. But it was started by the same people who dug the, the Suez Canal in Egypt. They had a contract with Colombia to build a canal. Now, they went broke. But the United States had to buy that contract first. And so he is going to be involved in everything. So even though he was not Panamanian, he was there, involved in the government. He was uh, so he leader of negotiations with Colombia. And he helped negotiate a deal with Colombia where the United States would pay $5 million for the canal. But Colombian legislature said, that's a steal. No, you are stealing from us. And they doubled and said, we want $10 million. Because Colombia knew the United States is going to collect tolls to go through that canal. And that is going to be millions of dollars. And if Colombia is going to give a little strip of land to the United States to dig a canal, so they're going to give a part of their country. They want a little bit of something. As it would turn out, $10 million, way low. It's a steal. And once the canal is built, the United States is going to clean up. And everyone knows it. Roosevelt was furious. Yes, Roosevelt knew it was a steal, too. But Roosevelt was like, you, we negotiated a contract. We're not going to pay it. And so all of a sudden, in 1903, there's a revolution in Panama. The Colombians are kicked out and Panama declares itself an independent country. Isn't that amazing coincidence? A revolution in Panama. Gee, and I bet that government's going to be pro a treaty with the United States to build that canal. I'm sure these are all coincidences. All of them. So there were no roads connecting the rest of Colombia to Panama. No roads, yes. 1903. 1903. There are no roads because it's so mountainous and a rugged ju jungle. And so when the revolution began in Panama City, Panama was going to send uh, forces basically to put down the rebellion. It had to be by sea. This might shock you, but there were small U.S. naval squadrons on both sides of the isthmus that wouldn't allow Colombia to come in. And Buena Gorilla just all of a sudden had all this money to buy up various officials to overthrow the government. Do you get my point here? Who engineered this revolution? The United States engineered a revolution with the help of a few elite Panamanians who were all going to be in the government. And I should add one more thing. Roosevelt, who would send out a message congratulating the freedom fighters on their victory. And also saying over and over again, the U.S. had nothing to do with it. He sent this message down via telegram. Now, he thanked, he congratulated them. He had the dates wrong, and it arrived two days before the revolution began. The United States engineered this revolution. So there's a little bit of something like this in California, but Hawaii. But this time, it's the U.S. government for sure from Washington, D.C. And this would set the precedent. The United States is going to do this many times in Latin America, or at least attempt it over and over again. Most recently, the United States tried to do this in Venezuela just in the last year. And two months ago, they did it in Bolivia. The U.S. helped overthrow the government there. And so the U.S. is still doing this in other countries, something that we would be furious if a country tried to do to do us, or maybe not. I guess not. Okay, so with that, I'm sure if somebody got involved in our elections, we'd be mad, but that would never happen. <laughs> Just wait till this election. <coughs> so, by the way, you know what country I'm talking about? Swaziland, right? What country? Yeah. Okay, so the Panama Canal. By the way, this cartoon fits in. And almost immediately, a treaty would be ratified. 
the Hague, John Hay was American Secretary of State, point of Barella Treaty. No way! How did he get a seat in government? This man who wasn't even from Panama would become the secretary or their foreign minister. And they negotiated a treaty, and guess what? The United States would get a canal zone. And the, the U.S. would pay $10 million to Pam, the new country of Panama. Why is that number familiar? Yeah, that's what Colombia won, and we said it was too much. And then $250,000 a year. That would be doubled and then doubled again. Because it was so clear the United States was getting so much out of this. It's going to be a 100 year lease, or at least through 1999. The U.S. would actually uh, return their territory back to Panama in 1979, which is going to be a huge issue when that happened. But, you like the cartoon? Teddy Roosevelt digging the canal. New Panama, and what's he dumping the dirt on? Yeah, the capital of Colombia, Bogota, right there. Good cartoon. Is this pro Roosevelt doing this or anti? You know, it almost looks anti. It kind of does, right? But it's actually pro. It's like, isn't that great? We're getting Colombia. When what is that? We could just cheat in Colombia. But the big problem was. Engineering through a mountain, having to go through a tunnel divide to dig a tunnel and these incredible locks to get the water up and down this divide. For the first year and a half was a disaster until the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers sent Colonel Walter Dottles. Dottles was, uh, he worked on canals and levees on the, on the Mississippi River, and he began to reorganize construction. So he's going to get a lot of construction for this immense feat. But then there's one more thing. A big problem when they first started is they sent a bunch of American workers down there, and what happened to them? Infectious diseases. Specifically what to? Yellow fever and malaria. Even though cholera was bad, too. It's those two were the biggies. Working separately, but then they would pull their resources. Two Army doctors, Walter Reed, and William Gorgas, by the way, there's a lot of W in the first names here. Reed was in Havana. So it made sense he'd be in Havana after the, uh, the Spanish American War. Gorgas in Panama. They discovered what was spreading the yellow fever and the malaria. Yeah, the mosquitoes. And the realization is if you can get rid of as much calm water as possible. And is there somebody in my hallway? What's that? Oh, the the creepy picture. <laughs> I don't know who did it. Well, you get rid of standing water, the larvae you won't have a place to hatch. You can't get rid of them all, but like for example, in Havana, get rid of especially in the rainy season, like cisterns that would be filled with water. Don't you know, dump them out or put something <laughs> in it that they can't uh, the larvae can't breathe. And that would allow for more American workers, more Panamanian workers were hired, and they began to dig the canal. And this would be an incredible feat, because this is the divide. And they had to cut through the mountains. And it is, in a, I've only seen pictures, I would like to go through it. Has anyone gone through it? So, three cla four classes of AP US history, one person has. Yeah. Um, in elementary school, they told us that the Panama Canal was like a super dangerous place to talk. They said, like, a lot of like, bad things. Like, that's what they took. That's what my teacher told me. I remember that. Is that true? No. No. Why would not? The Panama Canal? She said there was like pirates. <laughs> no. Not in a canal. In fact, the canal is really narrow. Like today, modern, that's why the, the Panama has just finished a, a much wider canal. Because it's not wide enough for the new modern car probably. Big container ships or super tankers or the American super carriers. I've never. <laughs> no. She said they like wash your clothes. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, Panama. There's some issues, but Panama is a very safe and stable country. So it's Costa Rica. The Nicaragua has gone through hell, but you know. don't tell me the teacher. Yes. Well, so they fix the mosquito problem by like just. I'll show you how it works. I'll show you that in a sec. But Teddy Roosevelt became the first American president to ever leave the borders of the United States. The, the borders of the continent of the United States. No American president ever left the borders. It was actually really controversial. And they made very clear he never actually stepped foot in another country. 
he got aboard a U.S. cruiser, medium-sized naval vessel, at Tampa, and just sailed across to the Canal Zone, which was technically a U.S. territory. The first one ever to leave the continent of the United States. Does anybody know the first American president to actually leave the borders of the United States and step foot in another country? Woodrow Wilson, right after World War I, to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles. So, he got down there in his nice white suit. How did they get rid of the mosquitoes? Well, that's gold tools right there. See what they're doing? They took oil, and they just dumped oil. They went and sprayed oil every day on swamps. What would that do? This fine layer of oil would be on the swamp, and it would um, suffocate everything in the, in the swamp. Yeah, it's a horrible way to do it. This is awful. It's unbelievable they would do that. Sometimes they'd light it on fire. Yeah, so they basically just killed the swamps around there. Now, yeah, that's awful. But that did allow for some American workers to get down there, and by 1914, the canal would be completed. It, is an, it was an amazing technical feat. But look how narrow it is. They had to build it pretty narrow, and so as ships became bigger as time went on, they had to be... Either they wouldn't fit or they had to be very narrow. So that's this Iowa, that's the USS Iowa, a battleship in World War II. And they want battleships really wide. It makes them float better and also withstand, you know, if they fire their, these are 16 inch diameter guns. Nine of them. When they fire a broadside, you want a wider ship so it doesn't rock. That's that big. It fires a shell the weight of a car. But, by the way, they're obsolete now for the missiles. See how tight it is? You see that? There's a foot on each side. They made this ship just wide enough to get a fit through. Because the problem is you need to have nine 16-inch guns because of the pirates. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> kind of made my day. I had a good lunch and heard pirate stories. So with that. <laughs> Okay, it's 350 feet up the mountain, and that might not seem like a lot, but when you got to cut through to the bottom, that's really hot. It's an amazing thing. We should take a field trip. And in 1914, in fact, a month after World War I began, the canal was completed, and celebrations were all over, including the infection diseases at a major party, celebrating the canal opening up. By the way, there will be a traveling circus featuring animals not for canning, which is unfortunate. Also, Belgian forces hauled German advance using cream topped waffles. It's the onion again. Yes. All right, so Taft would re it still was the basic element of basic diplomacy, but when he replaced Roosevelt as president, they called it dollar diplomacy. And yes, it was supporting American big business and corporations like United Fruit. But their main goal was stability. Oh, yeah, they would still use the military. They'd still intervene. But they wanted stability. And what would they use to bring stability? Debt. They would get these countries in public debt. So get their governments to borrow as much money as possible from U.S. banks. And yes, they might intervene for that money. But what the debt does is these countries especially these dictatorships, are poorly managed, they skim money off the top, and if they can't pay back their debt, these countries have got to go back to the United States and say, please help us with our debt. And what would the U.S. say? Sure, but you must do this, 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 and this. And that's how you control, through debt. Get them in debt. So here's a cartoon of Wilson, or Taft putting away the big stick, and say, you go in there, these companies, and take what you want. And it's, it's pretty duplicitous. This will be a lot of resentment because of this. The United States would not go away totally from basic diplomacy or taller diplomacy until 1933. And they would go back to it again in the 1970s. Why 33? Who became president? FDR. And FDR wanted to end that because he wanted strong allies in Latin America, not countries that would exploit. That didn't totally work, and now, now, debt. By the way, that's a warning for all of you. I'll talk about it again. Debt is scary. If you're in debt, you run out of, 
you don't have many choices for life. I'm not kidding. If you got to pay back college loans, or you buy a house, or buy a car, you can't be too picky about your job. You can't complain about working conditions. You can't say, this job is horrible, and I'm going to move across country. You don't have those choices, because if you lose your job, you can't pay back your debt. I can't emphasize that enough. Debt is something. I'm in debt. We all have debts. But it, it narrows your options. Don't forget that. And on that happy note, no, that is a big element. We'll talk about that. Because that was a plan. We'll talk about the 1960s. The shut up college age people. Go and make them on to debt. So with that, a similar thing was happening in Asia. In Asia, you have European powers moving in, picking off weaker countries. And the reason why they're weaker is kind of economy to scale. European powers had begun the Industrial Revolution first, so they had more advanced technology. And so you can see Britain solidifying their empire by the end of the century. And that includes, you know, what, what country is this today? Pakistan. What country is this? What country is this? Burma, now Myanmar. What country is this? It's Malaysia, but then they called it Malaya. They also took a big part of Persia, which is now Iran. So Britain's expanding here. France. Oh, what country is this right here? Vietnam. There'll be nothing. We don't, there's nothing to see here. Indonesia was the Dutch East Indies. Here's the U.S. and the Philippines. Russia is coming into Manchuria. Japan defeated, shocked everybody, defeated China in war in 1894 and took Korea and this island here called Formosa. Anybody know what kind of, well, that's not really a country, it's a gray area. What is this today? Taiwan. And so other power, powers are moving in, and what are they eyeing? China. They're picking out pieces of China. Britain has fought two wars with China. Do you remember the, I've mentioned those once before, to force China to open up to all sorts of trade, but specifically to sell a certain type of addictive drug from India? Opium. Two opium wars. China is now starting to be carved up. They went from being incredibly rich in 100 years to being incredibly poor. And yes, there have been a lot of Chinese immigrants. Just to review, remember the, a lot of immigrants came from railroads and mines. And what was that? What was the law to keep out China? It's kind of such an exclusion fence. They call it the Oriental or Chinese Exclusion. I fear we've already had that once before. So the United States is already looking at China. That's the first anti-immigrant law. But the U.S. is involved in those same treaties. And I put this up here because this, given the, uh, this political uh, tool of saying that we'll build a wall to stop immigrants coming into the United States to keep them outside our country, this goes back to the 1880s. Here is a... Chinese wall around the United States to keep the Chinese out. So people think that 2016 President Trump like invented that. No. No, he was taking it, or his advisors got him to say it, taking it from something that's 130, 140 years old as a way to keep them out. The point is, it's not a new thing. But in 1900, a huge event's going to happen in China that will have so many divergent paths of history. It's, it's really hard to even wrap your mind around it. Especially knowing how powerful Chinese China is today. It's called the Boxer Rebellion. In 1900, the Chinese were furious. They had been exploited by economic imperialism. All the great powers signed all these, they literally called them unequal treaties that allowed for great powers to exploit China. Some countries were even starting to look like they're going to carve, or they were carving out colonies of China. And at the same time, beginning in the late 1880s, Protestant missionaries, mostly from the United States and Britain, were pouring into China. And this, combined with economic imperialism, really angered a lot of Chinese. And this is going to lead to these secret groups, because how to do it in secret, because there were foreign powers everywhere. And a lot of these groups against um, foreign imperialism met in these martial arts clubs. A number of them around the British colony of Hong Kong were called the Peaceful and Harmonious Fist. And it would be from there that an uprising against Western or foreign interference would be, foreign influence would begin. From the Peaceful and Harmonious Fist. Now, they're martial arts clubs. We're in all martial arts, right? 
Well, the British, they, that made no sense to the British. But when the British fought, they boxed. So if you're punching somebody and fighting, you're a boxer. Thus, the boxer rebelled. That's how come it got that name. And this was an uprising targeting, targeting foreign traders, some foreign troops out there to protect the traders, and missionaries. In the capital of Beijing, which then Westerners called Peking, they would, in fact, I was just changing to Beijing when I was in high school. So I started giving it a more phonetically sounding name. They surrounded the area where all the foreign embassies were in, in uh, Beijing. And this is going to be known as this 55-day siege as 55 days in, in Peking, because that's what Westerners called it. And there's, there's a really cheesy movie about this, too. If you want to watch a really cheesy movie, and who doesn't? But they surrounded the embassies. And so all the embassies were in there. Basically, they're kind of trying to hold them hostage. Well, all the great powers reacted. As they saw it, by the way, that's a boxer right there. All the great powers sent troops to put down the rebellion. And the thing was, yes, there's a lot of Chinese, but... All the great powers had machine guns, and they had better rifles, and they had rapid-fire artillery. The Chinese didn't have a chance. And when I mean all the great powers, I mean literally all of them. So we have Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Russia. Japan is now a great power, the newest one, and the United States. Here is McKinley. Beating Uncle Sam in the battle. And the flag says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness under treaty rights. So why we're just defending our treaties, which are really unequal. But look how they draw the boxers. That's just animals, subhuman. And what are they holding on their bayonets or their pikes? Human heads, you know, they always want to make sure that's a woman they killed. And then what they just killed, he is knifing a woman. And notice it's a baby wrapped in an American flag they just killed. Now, was that happening? Not really. No, it's propaganda. And here's British, China, or Japanese, and American forces storming the legation. And they, they beat back the Chinese. The Chinese had to submit. But this would be a radical shift to the Chinese today. That is the moment they begin to break away from foreign. They say that is the moment that modern China began. And we will never let them do it again. In Chinese schools, they learn about the Boxer Rebellion. In Chinese schools, this is a glorious moment. Oh, sure, they were defeated. But it was the beginning of them becoming great. And you can't trust the West. With that, Western power or European powers, the great powers realize it's going to be hard to colonize China. The United States, remember they're going through the Filipino insurrection and this is going on. They proposed something called the open door. Secretary of State John Hay sent this message out that we should all not colonize China, but equally exploit China. All those unequal treaties, all the great powers can use those. So Britain signed a treaty, we all use it. And so they can equally exploit it. So there's going to be some cities in China that would become trading stations, but only a few, like Hong Kong, would become full colonies. <coughs> and this is implying Uncle Sam is protecting China from the great powers trying to uh, cut it apart. So that's Germany, Austria, Britain, Russia, and France. And then in the back is a country that really wanted to be great powers. Yeah. They really wanted to be. It we just didn't quite make it. They kept trying. They're pretty powerful now, but this with American gunboats, troops, they divide China up, but technically wasn't colonies. But you notice that for World War II there. It's when Japan decided that they didn't want to follow the open door in 1931 and then later 1937. So they went to war in China to just take it themselves. That would be the trigger of the Pacific theater of World War II. Remember what I told you, it was all about imperialism. And it started over open door in China. And this would turn into China's quagmire, but 
And you combine Boxer Rebellion to the open door and this fueled resentment in China towards foreign influence. And the communist revolution in 1949, much of their impetus was stop foreign imperialism. And China today, yes, they still call them communists, but they are in reality a, a authoritarian super capitalist state that calls themselves communist. They still talk about the open door. We're not going to let them do it again. We're not going to let them sign treaties to exploit us. We'll exploit them. Which they are doing. If you know anything about what China's doing in the Indian Ocean and in Africa, oh, yeah. And by the way, that would become big. Big. You may know why. Their minerals called rare earths, but they're necessary for any kind of high tech. And most of the rare earth minerals are in Africa. And guess who's getting them all? China. And we're kind of addicted to those things now. So with that, here's a great picture of the open door policy, the cartoon of the great powers as vultures, and coming in to carve on China. And by the way, I like that picture because China is still alive. And they're picking it apart. I should add, that's mean to vultures. Vultures are good at I like vultures. Who's with me? Vultures aren't bad. I mean, would you rather have dead animals rotten there or let somebody live off them? Right? <laughs> the anti-vulture bias. I like vultures. No one with me. When I was in New Jersey, I saw kettles of vultures, of like four or five hundred vultures just kind of circling. They're really cool. And then there are a few hawks in there too. And Japan in 1853. Japan in 1853 was isolated. They were relatively isolated. They really weren't a full country. They had an emperor, but they're divided up in little principalities. And uh, there's, a, there's a myth that Japan did not allow any foreign interference or any technology. That's not quite true, but they, were, they had muskets and a few other things, but they were way behind the West. And they did allow trade through a city called Nagasaki. Some of you know that city, but... In 1853, a small American naval squadron, these are steamships, and it was tiny, but Japan didn't have anything like this, sailed into Tokyo, Edo Harbor, under Commodore Matthew Perry, and they forced Japan to open up, basically sign a treaty. It was all for whaling boats. The U.S. wanted a base for whaling ships that were sailing the North Pacific. And this set off literally revolution in Japan. It's, it triggered a civil war. But eventually, a decade after this, Japan, the winners of the civil war called the Meiji, realized this is what we got to get. They triggered modernization. And Japan's going to have to modernize to get things like these ships, or they'll be taken. Because they can see all around them the British ships. And they knew about the opium wars. The first one happened just uh, five years before this. They knew. <laughs> we might be colonized. And Japan did an incredible thing. They went from being basically locked in about 1750 to being one of the great powers in less than 40 years. It's just incredible how fast they modernized. So you have this weird combination of the old and new in Japan up at that time. So Perry's got an interesting reputation in Japan. They look at him quite favorably as somebody who led us to a new world. Now think about the thing. Felt them favorably. That's what Perry looked like. This is a couple years after, 1855. This is how Perry looked in a Japanese textbook in the 1930s. That's how they draw him. What features did they give him? Japanese features, didn't they? Do you remember way back when, when I showed you a picture of Tecumseh? And the United States feared Tecumseh and really respected him? And I showed you the picture of how they draw, they drew Tecumseh. How did they draw Tecumseh? Like what? Well, he's an American, too. Yeah, like somebody, a Caucasian. Like a Caucasian. They respected him, so he must have some features like white Europeans. And that's what Jap Japan did, too. They respected him, so they gave him Japanese features. 
And so, yes, there is a racist element in there, too, in Japan. That's one of the reasons why World War II in the Pacific, if you know anything about island fighting in World War II in the Pacific, why it was so horrible. In many ways, it was a racial war. We'll talk a little bit about it. There's so much we have to pick and choose when we get there, but Japan, like I told you, defeated China, and they're now a great power. And then in 1904 and 1905, fighting for Manchuria, which was then technically an independent country, but both Russia moving this way and Japan moving this way, they would fight it out over Manchuria and Northern Korea. Japan took Korea. By the way, Korea and Japan don't like each other to this day. I don't blame Korea for that. But <coughs> they fought. And it's the Russo-Japanese War who won. We always name the loser first. So Japan won. And this shocked everybody. But the first thing Japan did is, before they ever declared war, knowing that a fight is coming, they attacked part of the Russian Pacific Fleet at their base in the colony of Port Arthur. They attacked it in a surprise night attack, a sneak attack, in the middle of the night using a new weapon called torpedoes. They attacked and disabled much of the Russian fleet. And there's nothing to learn from that. 38 years later, nothing at all like this will happen again by the Japanese to another Navy, maybe in another colony. It's pretty amazing. Pearl Harbor would be almost the same thing. It's like they're, they did it once before. Well, this would turn into a horrible, bloody fight where they found out something awful and nobody realized it. I'm not kidding. They just didn't see it. It was right in front of them. The new modern weapons kill on a grade that no one had ever seen before. Thousands would die with rapid fire artillery and machine guns. Just no idea. Artillery is the big killer. Just never dreamed it. They killed thousands of Japanese attacks on Port Arthur, but they would surround Port Arthur. And this surprised everybody because all over Europe and the United States, everybody assumed Russia would win easily. Japan had no shot. Oh, sure, they beat China, but they can't beat Russia. Now, it's not because of size. It's not because of experience, not because Japan is such a new great power. Why did so many people believe Russia would win? Huh? What's that? Yes, race. The Russians, especially the leadership, are Europeans. In fact, the Russian czar is a German. And so, race. Asians couldn't win. Racial differences. And boy, did Japan blow that idea up. Japan won. Not only did they win, they won one of the most important naval victories that shocked everybody. And you want to say terrified the United States. The battle was at Tsushima. And this is Russian propaganda showing how they're going to defeat the Japanese. This is a really good picture. You see it? Notice the Russian Navy? And they draw like a Northern European, blonde hair, blue eyed, you get that. Look at they draw the Japanese. And that caricature would be the caricature of Japanese, kind of a version of those pictures I showed you of how they drew the Filipinos. But a little bit different. If you saw World War II propaganda in the United States against Japan, it's almost that same face. And I'll show you some of those. So almost the same picture. And so they sailed, and I'm not making this up. Their main fleet all the way here took a year almost to go to here. Russia did. And they thought, we'll knock out the Japanese now. Russia's own, Russia's major ally was France. Anybody know why? They both fear Germany. Does that make sense? Anybody want to guess Japan's ally? Because they both feared Russia? Japan's ally was Britain. When the Russian fleet was going here, they were so scared that the Japanese would be using Britain as a base that when they saw British fishing boats in that night, they opened fire and sank five British fishing boats, thinking they were Japanese torpedo boats. And Britain and Russia almost went to war. That's one of those, wow, I could have changed the entire course of history. Because within a decade, Britain and Russia are going to be allies in, well, literally, the apocalypse, World War I. 
10 years, they'll become allies. Who knows how things would have been different. Let's put it this way. If they would have fought that war, and then World War I, when it came up, Germany would have won. Just I'm telling you, right now, Germany would have won. So that's a big deal. But fortunately, they didn't go to war. But they arrived here, and literally, they're on the way to Vladivostok. The Japanese jumped them and sank them all. The Battle of Tsushima, that's propaganda poster. This turned to be a little pixelated. I know what you're thinking, but, but Mr. Partridge, I want to know more about the battle, right? So I found this easy-to-follow map for you to know exactly what happened in the battle. And as luck would have it, for simplicity's sake, it's in Russia. <laughs> Here comes the Russian wave. Here comes the Jap Okay, so I found that map to be hilarious. Like, what can you do with that? So Japan won a, st a stunning victory. Stunning victory. And here's a great cartoon of Japan knocking Russia out, and here's France in the corner, and here's Britain in the corner. Here is one now that this racial superiority might be over. Asia for the Asiatics, and yes, it's a racist cartoon, but still, China, even though there were no France, and it says Eastern Monroe Doctrine. You know, it's Russia, the bear, Russian bear being knocked out right there. This was a radical shift, and Roosevelt got a coup. Roosevelt said, both sides wanted all this war. Trying to be much more deadly and expensive than anybody wanted. In fact, this would trigger a revolution in Russia. But Roosevelt got the treaty to be in Portsmouth by claiming it can't be in Paris because France and Russia are allies. So they met in Portsmouth, Maine. And here is you know, him as the peacemaker. Let us have peace between the two great powers. And Roosevelt would get the first Nobel Peace Prize, the first one for negotiating peace treaty there. But this is what you got to hear about the treaty. Japan was furious. Japan was furious about this treaty. They thought they'd won huge parts of Manchuria and didn't get it. And they were, they felt slighted. And they had resentment. And that resentment will build and build and build. Not a little bit to the U.S., but just the West in general. And so it's USA and Europe. Hmm? That's Tsar. That's Tsar, so. And that's the Orthodox cross, because he's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, where he was until. That's Nicholas until he was executed. <clears throat> And so, soon this would be dubbed the Yellow Peril. This is actually what the Germans said. But the Germans called Japan the Yellow Peril, and the United States adopted this. Because now you have this expanding Japanese empire, and isn't it running into the American empire? These are German-controlled islands. Here's Britain. Here's France. The Yellow Peril. And that's it. Nobody's exactly sure how, how that came about to call people from that part of Asia yellow. It is now become a racial epitaph, we're not sure, but it's it's pretty horrible. And when American Indians were called reds, that was, and, uh, and redskins, that was a mistranslation of something. And that's where that term comes from, which would turn into very much a racist epitaph, but I don't know how yellow, and I've seen it, I just don't know where that came from. So that's my way of saying I don't know from something. Don't you? See, I'm, I'm, I'm humble. Let's see. Let me add one more thing really quick. Japan was also really mad for this. Oh, I like this part. Look how they draw Japan. Another octopus. Let's get to this right here. The U.S. would send a fleet around the world called the Great White Fleet. No idea. And Roosevelt... I'll finish this. I have one little bit to finish and we'll talk about the jungle. So just remind me we're on the Great White Flip. Everybody, I know it's going to be really tough for all of you. You're going to be away from me for three full days. By the way, I thought somebody was going to put a dinosaur into the screen. Too late. You